Many thanks to Matt from um, Euro Bookstores and all the people that have helped us um, get organised here. This is part of Melbourne Design Week. Uh, it was actually sold out, we knew it was sold out Matt, uh, some weeks ago, um, so we can only assume that, that weather uh, notwithstanding, um, but the group that are here tonight are the group that are meant to be here tonight. So what we're calling this, as the whole book is intended to be, is uh, a series of storytelling, uh, conversations and sharing of experiences. So um, whilst our initial plan, and we will still do that, is to hear from some of the contributors from the book, um, we would definitely like to open it up so that we can hear um, any other perspectives that people might have around this climate crisis. There is an irony of talking about hot cities when it's freezing cold and raining outside, but of course, as we know, uh, in a slow emergency, um, you know, moments of climactic uh, experience don't reflect a warming world um, and the cities within which we live. So, um, so this book is really trying to unpack that in different ways. But thanks so much. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, that we are um, on unceded Wurundjeri land, uh, an ancestral sacred land that all Australian cities have uh, been built on. For those of us that work in urban research, this is something that we uh, you know, are, are reckoning with on a daily basis. And we have Ruby Porter here, whose work specifically uh, focuses on that, and we'll hear a bit more from Libby. Um, when I first came to Melbourne, I was immediately drawn to the work of Tony Birch, that many of you know as well. He's spoken very movingly and written about uh, the destruction of the Merry Creek um, in particular, which is an area that he grew up, um, and the ways in which the development of our cities has uh, affected so profoundly um, human nature, cultural relationships uh, in ways that are unravelling as we speak. So this is completely connected to our understanding of hot cities. Hot cities in a warming world are, are manifest in ways that uh, can only be understood if we think about those cultural, natural, ecological, um, and developmental post-colonial roots that, that create the spaces that we're in now. And just as by way of introduction, um, we have a number of people uh, who are maybe a little shocked at seeing the way that I've uh, picked photos of them from the, uh, the World Wide Web and uh, reflected them there. But some of these, I love these pensive, uh, jo Jody and Joe. Um, but yeah, and then the next slide as well is just a couple of other characters. And you might realise. <laughs> and I'm sorry, like this mystery, <laughs> speculative, uh, ghost like figure, um, uh, you know, sitting next to. And John Hammer would love to be here. He was one of the other organisers with uh, Ian McShane and I. Um, Ian, I, I hope everyone knows Ian, but Ian and I and John um, and Yolanda Strangers and Sarah Pink um, started talking about the idea of this book many years ago. Um, John and Ian and I sort of kept, kept moving with it, but Yolandi and Sarah Pink ended up being contributing authors to the book, which was fantastic. And Yolandi was going to be here tonight, but she unfortunately has COVID, so um, we're not going to see her. So the book is divided into the way we try to approach hot cities because we're coming at it from this uh, integrated um, uh, context of a warming world and the contemporary climate crisis context that we find ourselves in, we want to position it around keyword themes. And the keyword themes were piracy, fire, climate, risk, roots, shelter, community, technology, nature, ethics, futures, and the endless summer. Um, and our intent was the idea that no one discipline or one voice can possibly speak to um, what we're seeing unfold, uh, and in fact, the sort of regenerative and hopeful futures um, that we that we need to recreate. Um, and so the the idea was to bring different voices together um, and interplay those voices around those key themes. Um, so we, we put out a call. We invited people we found whose work was interesting, provocative, um, spoke to the themes, um, was engaging with questions of fire and climate and crisis hot cities in different ways, and we were really overwhelmed by the response that we got back. Um, these are the contributors, uh, and they transect the world. Um, they come across a whole range of disciplines. Um, we've got philosophy, uh, designers, wonderful artists, uh, community developers, um, engineers, scientists, historians, and the list goes on. And 
and the end of listening to the diversity of stories, it is really moving, actually. It's, it's, everyone was offered the same questions. People came at it from completely different understandings. Um, people understood HOP, for example, as contentious, political. Um, some people took it very in a very scientific manner. Some people spoke specifically and personally and emotionally about their experience with fire and bushfire. Uh, so it was just fascinating to see the way people interpreted and understood those ideas differently. And we would like to pay particular um, reference uh, to um, uh, um, you know, one of our authors who unfortunately has passed away in the last year um, since, uh, since, since this book was uh, put together. So, uh, you know, the books are, are a way you know, of telling stories even beyond uh, the life scale of some of, some of the contributors. Just the next few slides. I'm just going to show you a few images from some of the work of Ben um, and Jody, but they're going to speak to their own work. This is one of Ben's images. The next one as well. These are two more of Ben's images. I'm sorry, Ben, that they've been mashed together in this way. They're probably fine. Um, and then the next image is Jody's beautiful uh, work. Um, and then the next one again. And the next one. And we'll come back to those images when they get to speak. So my invitation now um, is for, uh, I'm just going to ask some of the authors to just come up. Um, and, and what they've been asked to do is just share a little bit about <coughs> the question that we asked them when we interviewed them, which was, how does your work intersect with hot cities? What, what do you feel in your work plays out in terms of hot city futures and, and whichever way they want to take that, Ben and I were just talking about this before um, when he first arrived, but whichever way you want to take that is absolutely fine. Um, so uh, I'm, Lauren, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to invite you to come up first, only <laughs> because you're sitting here <laughs> next to you. Um, and so uh, Lauren Rickards is a professor at Petrobe Uni um, and she was one of the IPCC um, authors and so has, you know, has had a very um, visceral experience with documenting, recording and trying to create change around climate adaptation. So, um, thanks. Great, thank you, Wendy. And um, yeah, it's a great honour and pleasure to be here to talk about this really, really interesting and I think um, really kind of catalytic project. So, one of the things um, I've looked at for a long time in my work is the role of metaphors and the ways in which we sort of, um, sort of diagram, if you like, in a really high level way, uh, our understanding of the world and climate change is shifting those kind of large cultural diagrams. And I think a project such as this really points to the kind of emergence of new, better metaphors. So away from the sorts of ideas of containers um, and silos to much more uh, rhizomic and much more um, open-ended and engaging way of thinking. And that is played out through this book through the process. So I really you know, respect the incredibly inclusive and inventive process that Wendy and Ian and John went through with this. Like just being um, interviewed for a book is really unusual and a great pleasure. It's like, it's like, it actually makes it fun. Um, it's, um, yeah, and it really invites, I think, a different way of thinking, this more open-ended and speculative way. Then the array of people they've brought together to talk about this is also, I think, really um, indicative of the direction that we need to go. Uh, and then also, of course, the different forms of knowledges that we've got here, the visual, the verbal, um, and, you know, say, so the written and then also the, the verbal here tonight. Um, so all of this um, sort of sits in a really interesting juxtaposition alongside kind of my normal work, uh, which is, you know, in, you know, at one level a lot more boring, <laughs> um, but also kind of, I think, pulses with some of the same kind of concerns. And so if I could just talk about um, two bits of that. so. One is the experiences, when you said, of being part of the IPCC, which um, you know, presents these kind of very formal, incredibly nitpicked reports uh, that are you know, highly unreadable and <laughs> very, very densely written. But underneath that sits this kind of immensely um, 
pulsing and messy process of a whole range of individuals across institution, cultures, nations, groups striving to get to groups with the kind of dynamic writhing um, academic literature on a topic that is in itself overtaking our ability to document it. So you've got this kind of like IPCC report sitting kind of, I don't know, it's a very nice metaphor, but like a kind of scab there, right? <laughs> Over this kind of really, really lively process. And one of the um, key things I took away from that process was, um, well, that experience was the ways in which our ability to get together as authors was um, more often than not uh, undermined by climate change related pressures. So we had events, um, so you know, almost near misses. So we flew into Kathmandu in Nepal, for example, for the second workshop uh, during torrential floods. The plane literally almost skidded off the runway. You know, it was kind of like this flying into this city, this incredible, again, pulsating city of Kathmandu. I'm not sure if you've been there down through the, um, the haze, which is kind of surrounded by these pristine mountains, down into the haze of the city um, in this incredibly climatic um, you know, weather event that was causing utter chaos to come in and talk about climate change. And it's just that sort of juxtaposition of the lived experience of doing that and then um, the kind of effort to document it what I guess I'm trying to say is that the IPCC approach to documenting it while it has its place um, doesn't capture the reality. And I think a, a, an effort, effort like this does actually capture more of the reality, even though it's less wedded to you know, the factual documentation. So there's something there about sort of capturing the reality of what's going on. And the second thing to say is that, um, so I'm um, since moved to La Trobe, we're setting up the climate change adaptation lab and our focus is on this referent object we're calling work <laughs> and the reason we're focusing on work is because documenting and writing and working on climate change is hard work and at the same time climate change is undermining and changing and challenging our ability to work any sort of work informal work unpaid work including stuff like IPCC but other you know much much more important kind of everyday forms of work, every sector. And so we're trying to um, look at the adaptation of work that's needed and the, the work of adaptation. And again, I just wanted to, I guess, reference how important I think efforts like this are where people are, are invested, and I count all of us here tonight, in doing the work of talking and listening and thinking differently. And we just have to acknowledge, first of all, how important that is, and second of all, kind of how special it is and how we need to protect it. And I feel really, really anxious that our abilities to connect and come together and to think creatively and to talk like this are in and of themselves under threat. Um, so without putting it down on this, but just to say this is a really special thing to be able to do what we're doing here tonight. The book is a really special manifestation of that sort of work, and I think we need to really honour it. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, actually, um, Joe, I think you were one of the first, you, you were in the earliest chapter, straight after, um, you were in the fire chapter, which comes straight after Welcome to the Piracy. Would you like to come and share a few thoughts that you had? The, the role of artists in the book was really powerful for us. Uh, I know Ian and John and I found that particularly um, heartening and hopeful, and in fact, became one of our key themes in the final concluding chapter. Um, and Joan was also one of the, uh, the, the climate angels uh, with a great quote in the book where she says, police don't like um, arresting female angels. <laughs> so, Jo, um, I can just pass you the, the, uh, the microphone. Because you're an artist, a curator, um, yep. and you had some reflections about the role of artists um, yep. in, a little in creating change. Yeah. Yep. Um, in the exhibition fire, the two works that Jodie and Ben's works up there, so my role was to select works for uh, an exhibition called Fire. And the reason for that, for example, with Jodie's work with the cans that you saw, 
When you show uh, people a very um, personal, fascinating, intellectually engaging work, um, it can say quite complex things quite simply. Mm. So people can relate to it. I know that Jenny Kurtz's work, for example, is often said sometimes, like the IPCC report, this tome of writing, sometimes an artist can make a work that says what 10,000 words is trying to say that few people will read, can say it with one simple image, thought, or... So if, if an artists are concerned, as, as everyone in this room, and increasingly more and more people kind of realising what's happening, but um, artists have been concerned for a long time, so their work is incredibly important because it does uh, portray complex ideas quite simply, and that's and beautifully and eloquently and with passion and intelligence and creativity, <laughs> and there's a role for that in, in our life. Um, uh, at the opening of fire, Ben's beautiful charcoal. This is Jody's work. She will talk about that. Ben's beautiful charcoal work of his own experience of being in a fire. Uh, but uh, we had a man. Uh, I called him Fireman Dan. Dan Conlon, a pr professional firefighter, and he spoke to us about uh, uh, the next, the one with the. Uh, yeah, uh, he spoke to us about the severity of fire as a professional firefighter for years. This is not necessarily in cities, but he said in, when he first started being a firefighter, for example, a car on a road, there would be a chassis left. Nowadays, there's nothing left. The heat in the fires is... Uh, so this is just one example. As a, oh, that's enough from me. Don't think. <laughs> <laughs> never, Joe. Never. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Joe, would you like to come up and speak to um, some of the work that, that you do? So when I spoke to Jody, she was in France on a retreat. Um, so it's lovely to have her here in person. I used one of these for a long time. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I'm thrilled to be part of uh, Hot Cities and um, I'll just talk about my work, I think. This work here, I, I went to the Blue Mountains in New South Wales after the Black Summer's fires had gone through and I went there to see how I could creatively respond to such an event and um, when I went there, I. I usually draw and I made a decision not to draw because I wanted to see what else I could do. Um, so the first thing I did was went out onto the landscape and, and just sat there and um, was really affected by the, the total devastation, like the, the, the absolute quiet, except for this cracking noise. Um, which were the trees cracking. It's about two weeks after um, when I went and the ground was still hot. Um, it, 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 it was a, an experience that really affected me. You know, how could any living thing survive that? And, um, you know, all the trees, tops were gone. And I, I did see birds, which they were black cockatoos and that's why they're drawn. Um, but this particular work, when I um, walked out of the bush, I noticed the burnt cans because all the debris and shrubs and trees and leaves were burnt away and what had left behind was our rubbish. And um, so then I set about just collecting these bottles and cans. And um, what I found really interesting is they were thrown out at the side of the road through a scenic drive through the Blue Mountains. You know, mm -hmm. chucked out the window. And, um, I've got probably a thousand of them, but each one um, is, you, you know, was touched by a human being and they made a decision to throw it out. So when I made this work, they started to take on, um, they looked like little figures to me, all distorted. And, um, so I was quite proud of this work and, and you know, it all, I was also cleaning up rubbish at the same time. Um, yeah, and the birds, uh, I, I, looking up at, 
you know, you know with it, I, I actually wondered where did, where did all the animals go and there were bowls left out with water and um, food for animals that I even wondered would be able to find food. I did see, I thought it was a, a grey plastic bag blowing through the sticks, charcoal sticks, but it was actually a lyre bird. And what they did in the Blue Mountains was remove all the burnt logs so there was nowhere for you know, any surviving birds or animals to hide in. Um, so these birds were drawn with the charcoal from, from the actual place where their habitat was destroyed. They're big works. And, and the, I did see a crow as well, um, but a couple of these birds. So I'm interested in what happens to the wildlife as well as the people. I interviewed um, people after the Black Summer fires and, and their experience um, and the difficulties that they face. You know, every couple of years the fire comes through and this one was more intense. so beautiful about the way different people can see different, uh, can experience and um, translate and explore and explain our different experiences in the times that we're in. Um, th this image really uh, strikes me because of its, it, it feels like that's that's where we're at at the moment, you know, we're, 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 we're charred, we're spluttering, we're, we're, we're not flourishing, um, but we're, there's hope there um, because it's, there's still, still agency and movement. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's um, I might be, I might throw to you because there's a synergy of the, the trio of thinking differently from different artistic perspectives, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're coming at it from a different perspective again. Um, thinking globally, thinking politically, as well as thinking personally. Oh, well, thanks, uh, Wendy. And um, <coughs> I really appreciate being um, uh, for and being involved in this book project. So thanks for that. Um, I was thinking about what to say, and one of the reasons I got into art, went back to art after being a furniture maker for many years, is because I wanted to be involved in conversations that of great import. And um, art is a, is a great vehicle to do that. Um, but I was also thinking about, um, when I was sitting here today, I was also thinking about the incredible mind-boggling resistance that still um, still persists in resisting action on climate change and, um, and all of the things that we can do to mitigate. And I was, um, this is sort of feel, but I was talking to my my good mate who's my bookkeeper and we're going through the book and I was like, every, every, even when I can't afford it, every month this Australian Conservation Foundation kind of payment goes out. And he goes, oh, I was supporting Australian Conservation Foundation. He said, but my wife said, we can't afford it. We've got the private health insurance, we've got the corporate wear, we've got all this sort of stuff, so that's come off the list. And I said, you're getting private health insurance, but you're not supporting the environment. And for me, it seems like an equation which doesn't add up, like, because you can't just keep on borrowing from all this nat natural capital without putting back into it. And so, um, and there's so many ways in which, um, you know, you can take action um, to protect, to, to mitigate against these incredible pressures which nature is under. And I'm just comforting that someone to say something. Um, So I was talking to Wendy about um, tree planting, um, urban tree planting, just to mitigate against that sort of heat island effect which you get when you get a whole of concrete together. And, um, I've um, been gorilla planting these trees in, the, in our street and in this car park and actually 10 years ago I kind of um, pressured this landlord to leave exposed bits of ground so I could put trees in. Um, Anyway, so 10 years later, I've been managing these trees. They're getting really big. There's like local gums and blackwoods and lamandras and you know, beautiful thick, um, grasses growing. And the, um, the residents come out and they, um, 
there's tents upstairs and businesses. The businesses park in the shade of the trees and so because otherwise it's just blistering western sun. The tents come out and they, they blow up a pool and they sit under the trees and they have a couch there and they do all sort of stuff. And then I got word the other day that the landlord's going to come cut all the trees down. And, um, but for no other reason than it's, it's that equation, it's like it's too much work, it's too much making. And so again, it's that kind of idea of that resistance to, um, to actually thinking about a, a, the bigger picture about what action you can take and how you can, you know, he could just leave the trees there. You don't have to do anything to the trees. And he said to me, what do you want the trees for? It's not, it's not like it's the eastern suburbs, <laughs> you know, so like, <laughs> you know, I said, yeah, well, we're allowed to have trees in the northern suburbs, it's fine, you know. Um, so, and then, so, so the resistance to something just kept on popping up, and so that's one of the reasons why I sort of got back, I got to art was because, and the art world itself is, um, is resistant to direct conversations about climate as well. You have to kind of always be able to choose, or kind of come in for a really bleak angle and kind of suggest things, but you can't actually talk about it directly because it's like, well, it's just not kind of, doesn't fit the kind of the cool in a way. Um, and so, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so I suppose um, art is just another way for me to, be, to try and um, in, inject a bit of activism into these conversations within the, the art spectrum because it has a larger audience. But I'm also just like the idea of, um, of just every day doing some kind of something active to combat um, just bad behaviour and just resistance to change. And I mean, you know, we get a lot of commercial rubbish in our street. This is like another small story, but I'm sick and tired sick of sitting behind a recycling truck when it picks up the food waste, then it picks up bottles, then it picks up polystyrene, fish, then it goes down to the medical centre and gets all the medical waste chucked in. And it's meant to be separated. In the meantime, it all goes and gets dumped, and there's all these emissions coming up. And it's like, that's it, bam, EPA. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I do it all the time, like all the time. And it's just like, it's just unbelievable how resistant society is to embracing what needs to be done for change. So that's why I changed my career to do art so I could actually make images that contribute to these conversations. So. Um, thank you. And I know a perfect segue to Libby, who knows something or two about activism, um, but coming from a different perspective. Um, and thinking about Libby was part of the Roots chapter, um, and thinking about what that means in a certain colonial context. But feel free to take it in whatever direction you want. Thanks, um, thanks everyone. Uh, how lovely to be in conversation um, about this beautiful book. Um, that is so nice to see the images for, and I wonder if you might just go up one to the, um, that one, because that speaks to me a lot for the reasons that hopefully will um, be relatively coherent over the next couple of minutes. Um, so um, I was a little bit resistant, actually, to despite my good friend Wendy doing a little bit of that. Um, come on, Porter, um, I wanna, we want to be part of this book, because I wasn't sure I had anything to say really about this question. Um, but of course, uh, as others have reflected, the beautiful process of, of bringing the book together was such a generative one. Um, uh, I discovered all sorts of connections that I, I hadn't really perhaps thought about in those terms. So for me, it was a really insightful um, experience to be in conversation um, about the ways in which hot cities might relate to questions of belonging and home and fundamentally about land, um, which is m most of where my, my kind of day job um, is, but also where my head resides a lot about, you know, the, the, just the fundamental question of what is land and how did we come to be here like this? How did I come to be here like this? Um, and so um, just positioning myself as a, a settler, a colonist in this context, here um, and uh, and also then to pay respects, um, riffing off Wendy's earlier acknowledgement that um, I shouldn't belong here. Um, perhaps you might be positioned in a similar way, um, and yet I do, um, and that my belonging, um, which is is kind of like this this image, is this your image? Yeah. Yeah. 
it's very beautiful um, and also kind of scary um, and speaks to me, I don't know if this is what you intended, but I'm going to give you my, my response, um, speaks to me as a kind of, you know, coming apocalypse um, and, and it seems very resonant for me with, with the question of colonialism um, and the, the smoke being the coming catastrophe uh, and um, I use images like this, not with the smoke so much, but um, like this with the, this is, I'm totally off script here, um, with the, with the pastoral and the, the laying out of property boundaries. So this image to me speaks so um, importantly of the ways in which um, our response to land um, is such an extractive one. We constantly see it, see land as an as a inert object that's there to be dominated and um, uh, our, my, my cultural perspective, um, Western um, white supremacist idea of, of land as something to be, to be held, owned, possessed, exchanged, extracted from, all those things is so extractive that we end up with images like this made possible because of that you know, fundamental organisation of how we are on land. Um, I don't know if you know, but that's a charcoal drawing. It's not a photograph. Indeed, yeah. So it, it's that's what it strikes me as so yeah. extraordinary. Um, partly for its, well, its uh, artistry yeah. and workmanship, but also for its because it, I so often work with photographs like this. Um, that uh, anyway. So thank you, Ben, for mm -hmm. helping us <laughs> for um, for. Um, presenting it. And um, so that's a kind of very long and roundabout way of saying um, my own response to the idea of, of hot cities and my own concern is about foregrounding um, the, 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 the literal things that sit underneath us, um, which is the question of land and how we might have come to be here and the forces of violence um, that sustain certainly my being here, my family's being here, um, and the ways in which those um, forces of extractivism um, and constantly taking, as you were just describing before, um, produce uh, a situation in which we now have to think otherwise, like we're doing here and like all the other um, contributors have been talking about, uh, about how to respond. Um, and yet I'm fearful that we uh, are still missing huge parts of, of the conversation that needs to be to be present so you know it's not my place at all to speak um, about uh, the importance of indigenous knowledge systems but they seem terribly important because they've been here a very long time um, and uh, that, that's not for me to speak about but certainly as a coloniser it is my job um, to think about how to change how we think about this to enable a different kind of conversation um, to be happening and to foreground um, the processes of colonialism, the coming catastrophe, the present here catastrophe um, that is always unfolding every day and into the future and how we might um, shift our, our thinking about that. So, thanks. <laughs> Hoping this is whetting your appetite to engage with the chapters and see the way these uh, voices and stories are woven um, together um, throughout. So, would you like to build on your activism, which is coming from a different perspective, but it has a lot of resonance with what the minister said. Sure. Uh, kia ora. Um, my name's Sire. I'm originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I reside here in Wurundjeri country. Um, and I'm grateful that you've invited a part-time guitar player to speak <laughs> to this uh, lovely uh, project. Uh, just, a bit of, just an aside, um, my partner and I recently bought a conservation block, or a block we will put a conservation order on, uh, of um, River Rigum uh, and uh, up near the Grampians. Not a large one, um, but it needs, we want to see it have long term, term protection. First time we drove onto the property up the track, <laughs> pretty rough track. Uh, the question, I was really struck by this question. Who lives here? Whose property is this? We now have legal title. So I'm, I'm sort of referencing Libby's sort of comments about boundaries and who owns things and, and thinking, and this is full of uh, uh, obviously indigenous um, uh, people in the area had a long connection to this, this area, but there are lots of other beings 
that were, you know, were currently running away from us at the time, <laughs> bounding off into the forest. Uh, but it was their home. And it, I'll be really struggling grappling with this whole idea about what does it mean to own stuff and own land and how should we think about it? Coming back to the question of um, what, how I got into this project, uh, I have a, a musical project called Music for a Warming World. Uh, should we now be called Music for a Much Hotter World. And it's a multimedia project. So we have a big screen like this, and uh, we do large scale multimedia video and stuff, and live music. And we, with a narrative arch, it's not just a normal gig, it's a starting point, a middle point, and an end point. And we've been telling a story for a number of years now, since 2015, of the storm, the science, grief, change, all the, you know, the renewable revolution and all these other things, and hope. But the last two or three years, I've really been given pause to reconsider that narrative. So I started to understand my role as a songwriter, and I also I work at the university as well, so I have a, a number of other roles, but my role as a songwriter uh, in this project really is about narrative. And what is the story of the climate, or stories of the climate that I'm trying to tell? And so <coughs> we've pivoted, we being me, honest about it, have pivoted very strongly away from uh, raising climate consciousness to realizing this fundamental reality. We are so deeply unprepared for what's already happened, let alone what's coming. And so the focus of our show when we perform it, and the focus of all my thinking and writing, this is why I'm very excited about Lauren at Latrobe, this is where I work, uh, around climate adaptation, is, is how do we prepare for the future? So the conversations that I have with our audiences, with, with friends, with, and I run a, a climate musicians climate crisis network, and we have regular conversations with people around these sorts of issues. Um, when I raise the question of how do we prepare, people generally default to a spiritualization of the climate, to a sort of an emotional, we've got to deal with, you know, we've got to, um, you know, look at our souls, we've got to look at our cultural habits, and I see this sort of dematerialization of the language by which many people who believe in climate, in the reality of climate change, it has not yet translated into material, material reality in their lives. And um, some here have experienced bushfire, you know, and uh, I know a number of people who have. That, that makes it real, but a lot of the people I know give intellectual assent to it but yet have no real sense of, when I ask them, uh, a question I posed just recently to a, a bunch of people, you know, a conversation we were having, what, how are you vulnerable? And they immediately deflect to things like the social justice issues around the other, which is absolutely critical, so don't, don't for a second think I'm deflecting from that. But the question of, um, how are you uh, vulnerable? Where do you, that is the place you live vulnerable? And what ways is it vulnerable to the changing climate? Given the source of, of climate shocks we've seen around the world, and we know that they're going to get, and you know, I, I, I feel fearful in many ways for that future because I can see things happening that we are completely unprepared for, particularly in Melbourne, things like heat waves, and of, of a level we have not experienced nor are prepared for. And it seems that making that psychological shift into really grappling with how do I prepare my own home, how do I work out where I'm going to buy, where, where, where I should live, those even basic things are often missing from the conversation. So one of the things that I think I explored partly in, this, uh, in the discussion was thinking about uh, how to do that, and, try, and I'm trying to do it in an artistic sense. And I actually don't know how to do it, to be honest. I'm struggling with the language. And I think the final point I'd say is that in terms of the big narrative is, um, 
I'm going to remind myself what it was because it was really important. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that keeps me awake at night is I don't think we, we I think we've missed the opportunity for an orderly transition into the future. I think if we had started 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, we may have had a shot in terms of all the structural, the sort of scale of the structural changes that we need. Um, I, we have to strive for that, but I actually don't think it's possible without to have an orderly transition. I hope it's the case. I hope I'm wrong. I hope you can point a finger and say, remember Simon, you really missed the boat, but I don't think it's going to be the case. And I'm thinking a lot about what does it mean for our institutions, for our communities, our cities, our, you know, one's own family and one as an individual, when we're going to have a very spiky future with the maldistribution of uh, opportunities and possibilities. So I often turn my guitar and sign one to try to explore those sorts of things. Um, you know, so I want to say a uh, little hopeful message here, I'm sure. <laughs> so thanks. Well, I'm going to ask um, Ian, who was one of the contributors, thanks Ben, I know you've got a video. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, um, Ian was, anyone who knows him, Nick Shane knows what a humble and thoughtful uh, person he is. So, Ian, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I hardly know myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. There is a, there's a word uh, of Greek origin you may know, ekphrasis. Ekphrasis means talking about pictures that you can't see, talking about images. Uh, I was sitting there wondering whether there was an equivalent uh, word that described talking about a book that you can't see. Um, <laughs> you, you can in August. <laughs> we can see the URL. Anyway, um, uh, um, perhaps less, less flippantly, um, uh, a, a, a geographer, um, a scientist specialising in, in risk and emergencies, and a, and a historian, Walk into a bar. <laughs> well, there's no punchline uh, because there's no conclusion. There was the beginning of the conversation. Uh, that's how the book unfolded, um, very much uh, due to Wendy's leadership. And um, for me, the historian, it was a particularly interesting process uh, because it did open on some worlds that I was both interested in as a curator in a former life, but but was unable to associate and resolve. Anyway, I think we wanted to do three things in the book. Uh, we wanted to try and bridge uh, um, some substantial gaps in knowledge making and understanding, particularly around climate science. The first was a division between climate scientists, very broadly constructed, and social scientists. And one of our contributors, uh, American sociologist Eric Kleinenberg, um, said this, um, this is, is one of the quotes from the book that I think points to that problem. He said, the study of global warming cannot be dominated by climate scientists because hot weather gets dangerous through its interaction with social conditions, from neighbourhood poverty to social isolation, poor communities, and political neglect. That is one of the strands, one of the themes that we wanted to bring out through the book and Eric and others were really generous in their conversation um, and, and their, their contribution to enable um, that to happen. The second was the, the connection between climate science, social science and the arts. Um, and I was reminded um, and, and, and included in the book a very famous quote from the US environmentalist Bill McKibben, who said about 20 years ago, he said this, one species, ours, has by itself in the course of a couple of generations managed to powerfully raise the temperature of an entire planet to knock its most basic systems out of kilter. But oddly enough, although we know it, we don't know it. We, it is yet to enter our imaginative and effective realms. 
and this follows on very nicely from what Simon and, and, and other artists who presented were saying. Um, I think that's less so the case now, 20 years on, but I think it's a statement that continues to need uh, to be powerfully made. Um, that's all I wanted to say, uh, just to thank you all for coming. Wendy, would you like me to wrap up or can I throw it back to you? I just, uh, just want to read two quick yep. quotes from um, uh, David Carlin. And okay, from and Kasari right. Well, and thank you to you, Wendy, for your leadership. I hope um, that you enjoyed the book when it comes out. It was a fabulous process to do. I learned an awful lot because I know, you know, there's a, a lot more to know <laughs> yeah. uh, about this. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to read you this great quote from David Carlin, who is a writer, um, who is one of the contributors. He's one of the um, founders of the non-fiction lab at RMIT University. And he said, colonial settlements and their sediments need to be unsettled and dissolved into other flows. But we also need to find new ways to put our roots down. Bitumen, concrete, asphalt, steel and glass. These are the grammar of cities cars, the verbs. Um, so that was David's the thinking. And our youngest contributor was Kea Sarasani, who's um, a climate activist from Africa. Um, and she, she quoted, her quote that we use in the end of the first chapter um, is that the reality of climate change now is not a fiction. My pragmatism and optimism mean that I still have hope, but I find the future very scary. Um, and we just found that really um, compelling and it, and it was a, a way of navigating our way through the rest of the book. And I guess just to throw back to all of you, are, are you finding, you know, how do you feel in this context? I mean, in a way, probably thinking, well, hot cities means everything and nothing, and yet it does actually mean everything. Um, how do we navigate through um, the fear um, to, to move towards somewhere you know, that is more hopeful, if that's a word that you feel comfortable with using, um, but certainly a way that we can navigate some of the challenges that we're currently facing.